to uh, morning service, especially if you are visiting us here this morning. Psalm 145, verse 3, reads, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. We know you will sing of that greatness if we are first here. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
quite a few away this week, so exactly what's happening Tuesday, I'm not sure. But, so I've decided, well, I've decided, it sounds grand, doesn't it? But I'm going to let those who are going to be around to talk amongst themselves and decide what they want to do. So I'm letting Ma Malcolm, they're going to have to meet, meet together, meet here, it sounds like it, but Malcolm will uh, be coordinator, designated. We do have coffee morning starting again, and that will be uh, 10, 10 o'clock Thursday the 5th of August. And then next week we're expecting a visit in the morning from Charles de Lacey, and then in the evening it will be Ron. Streets to remember in prayer this week is Little Wakefield Hall Lane, Little Wakefield Road, and a place called Mariner's Court. A street called Mariner's Court. The uh, not a UEC church to remember, particular UEC church to remember in prayer, but the UEC in general, the group of churches that we belong to. And the Missionary Society to remember in your prayers this week is the Leprosy Mission. So there is a prayer letter at the back, or should be at the back, outside in the porch. A viable gone. Oh dear, it won't be too low. We'll print off some more. But uh, well, they would have been there for you to take if you need one. Thank you. We're going to rise and sing again of meekness and, and majesty.
in intercessory prayer. Our dear Lord God and Father, as we come now again to you, Lord, we have many things to bring before you. But Lord, again, we thank you that there you are so high and holy, and that we could not approach you. Yet you are glad to hear the prayers of your people as we call out to you on behalf of others. And we are aware that you are the God who meets our needs. We thank you, Lord, for your great salvation that brought us to yourself in the first place. And then, over the time, perhaps many years, you've kept us and milking us to you. And we thank you for this. But Lord, we come to you now to bring before you the, the needs of others, the needs of people here, in our locality, people from our own fellowship or connected with our own fellowship who are frequently in your need, in your need may need a touch now. We especially remember that there are Reynolds, Brian Wood, Daphne Lakin. Shirley Riley, Clyde and Jessica, Ben Chapman, Alan Kruger, and Joyce Cutman, Tony Johnson, Steve Adams. Lord, these people we bring before him. And Lord, others too that are known to some of us, who's not familiar with their needs, but all known to you. But Lord, we, we would uh, look beyond our, our own needs and those close to us. And Lord, we would look out into our higher community around the church. And Lord, how we would pray that they would touch some of the hearts of the people around them. And that we might yet see people coming to acknowledge you in these uh, difficult times. Lord, we know that some people have found things so difficult in, in the current situation. We think of those, again, again who have, have lost loved ones in the, in the pandemic. But Lord, we just to you know, in, in their sorrow, and pray you might be a, a comforter. But at times like this, we would, people would realise that frailty of our lives and the need to be right with you. Oh Lord God and Father being so we pray for our witness. <coughs> and we pray for a little wider witness of uh, your work among our fellow churches in the EBC. Lord, you know the state of each of them. Lord, the some that perhaps might be during times of blessing. Others finding the things difficult. Struggling perhaps. And Lord, we pray that you will especially give them courage and strength in these difficult days. And Lord, as we think further of them and our land and its needs, and how we will just bring before you again those who have the uh, rule over us, our government and the decisions they make. We do acknowledge your will. I think it's your will that we should have a stable government. And we pray, Lord, that their decisions will be guided by you. And how we would pray, Lord, that they would acknowledge you and their accountability to you when we say so many around us turning away. <coughs> and as we look for the <coughs> wider world too, we think of the, the mission work that goes on. We think of the missions that are supported by us in this church, and today we're particularly remembering the leprosy mission and the work that they do. We need to pray that you will bless that work, we to realise that this is still a, a real problem in so many places around the world, and we pray, Lord, that people's needs will be met. We think especially too of that we are suffering church, your persecuted church. Oh Lord, and we do pray 
uh, for your people in some of those places where things are, are so difficult. We think of a country like China with the increasing surveillance over its people and the difficulties this is now presenting to, to your churches and especially to the pastors that we that minister in your name. Oh Lord, we do pray that you will give them courage and strength at this time. We do pray for the organisations, especially Lord, that minister particularly to the persecuted church, to your, to your people who are having to face so much. And we uphold before you the works of organisations like Barnabas and Open Doors. We thank you for them. We thank you for the help and the aid that gets them. We thank you for workers for them who risk their own life in getting help the learning to others. Lord, we pray that you will truly bless them. But now, Lord, as we continue in this service, we just pray that, Lord, you will indeed bless and challenge us all. Oh Lord, we are conscious of our own weakness at this time, but we thank you that we can indeed go through, through Christ and all things through our, our Saviour. And then for the history, oh Lord, help us to do this, that we will remain faithful in, the, in these present times when perhaps our own faith and courage is going to be tested more than it has been. Lord, help us and bless us now. We pray that you will be with us and go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, mm -hmm. Right, we come now yeah. to our reading this morning. The question is going to bring to us, but first of all, she's got a notice about the latest conference.
I've got four of these this morning, so if anyone wants one this morning, I'll willingly hand these over, but there will be more tonight. So let's have our Bible reading, and it's John, and it's chapter nine, <coughs> chapter nine, and it's verses one to twelve. <coughs> Jesus heals a man blind, born blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no, work can, no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means say. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begged, begging, asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. But may God bless that reading to us this morning. Well, we'll come back to a look at that passage after we've sung our next hymn from the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun. And we'll stand on every promise of his word. <laughs>
Um, most of you will know that when it comes to my turn to preach, uh, I'm intent attempting to do a series on the miracles of Christ that are recorded in the Gospel of John. And there are eight of these miracles in total. But John makes it clear that these were only a select few from the vast number of miracles that he could have recorded. Nevertheless, they were sufficient to fulfill his purpose, which was to prove who Jesus was and is. And he explains all this towards the end of the Gospel in chapter 20, when referring to the miraculous signs carried out by Christ, he writes, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now as I said, there are eight of these miracles in all, and today we've reached number six. The previous five were one, the changing of water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. Two, the healing of the nobleman's son. Three, the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda. Four, the feeding of the five thousand. Five, the walking on water. And now today, number six is the healing of the man born blind. Uh, the actual miracle itself is described in those 12 verses, uh, first 12 verses of chapter 9, which Christian read. Uh, but the investigation into the, the healing and the ensuing controversy with the Pharisees over it uh, continues through the remainder of the chapter, which goes to verse 41. Um, so it would help to keep Bibles open or advice and be looking on, on through them because I will be referring to those later verses, I just thought it would take up rather a lot of time in my actually included them in the reading. So as to when this miracle occurred, we have reached that point in Jesus' ministry where the opposition is growing. In the previous chapter we read how the Jews were so incensed by the claims he was making about himself in the temple courts. Um, that we read in the final verse that they were picking up stones to stone him, making it necessary for him to quietly slip away from the trouble. And during that time when Jesus was speaking to the people in the temple courts, he had made that great declaration, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now in the healing miracle, which now follows, he is going to give that statement a living demonstration to support that claim. So we come to chapter 9, verse 1, where we read that as he went along, and that would be from the, the temple area, he now saw, he fixed his eyes upon a man blind from birth. And this caused the disciples to question him why he had, uh, uh, why he had, um, why this disease had come to that man, and that he was in such a pitiful condition. Their own conclusion was, this suffering must be a result of sin. Whose was it? And for them there were only two possible answers, the blind man or his parents. And quite what particular misunderstanding they were on to believe that he could have seen before birth, we are not certain. Well, his disciples were right in believing that this man's blindness was the result of sin. If Adam had never fallen, people would never be blind, deaf or dumb, or have any other physical defect to which we might succumb. And while Scripture does teach that suffering in a, in a general sense is the result of sin, it should not be individualised in this way in every case. The disciples should have understood that from the book of Job, which clearly teaches that Job's suffering is not the result of sin, he is only nobody else's. Throughout most of that week, Job's three early friends 
were wrong in the trial to be convinced Joe that his suffering was punishment for his sin. And Jesus corrects this misconception by his disciples and tells them that the reason for this man's blindness is so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. He was born not blind specifically, so that at this point in his life, Christ could display his glory and power in healing him. And the ability to work such a miracle points into who he was, to his divinity. And the main purpose of all miracles is to authenticate both the messenger by whom they come and the message that they actually bring. And we can see an illustration uh, of this in the life of uh, John the Baptist. There came a point in his life where he seemed to be entertaining doubts as to whether Jesus was the Messiah. So he sent to his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? And Jesus let them stay a while to watch him and listen to him. And one of the things that they witnessed was the blind receiving sight. So he replied to the messengers, this is in Romans Gospel, chapter 7, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So what Jesus was saying to them in effect was, all of the signs that you expect to see in the Messiah, you have seen in me. So returning to our passage, we come to verses 4 and 5 about doing the work of God. Now we know that throughout our Lord's earthly life, he was carrying out the work that his father had sent him to do. In this, he was following a, a definite timetable set them by his father. And so day, in his case, was the relatively short period of his earthly ministry. What is perhaps surprising though is that he said in verse 4, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. He includes his disciples in this task. And that is something which really should come as a, a challenge to every believer, not just limited to those around him at that time. All believers are called, like the Philippines, by Paul, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work for our salvation, for our salvation, of course, that we could never do. But work out the salvation that we already have. When he says night is coming and no one can work, night there seems to be a way of describing death when all opportunity of doing any more work ceases. In his case, he knew exactly when that time would be. And not so with us, of course. None of us knows when our life's journey will come to an end. And that should give us a real urgency in our Christian service. And then in verse 5 he says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And this is the second time he's made that claim to be the light of the world. It is a way of describing the purpose of his coming into the world. In one sense he is always the light of the world, but never more so within that brief period of his earthly ministry. In verses 6 and 7 we have the record of the actual miracle itself and the new, new way in which is carried out. We are told that he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Why did he not heal the man with a word or a touch as he did on so many other occasions with man? We're not told directly, uh, but I believe that it is safe to draw some conclusions of our own. By di using different means in his healing miracles, our Lord demonstrated that he was not dependent on any particular means, and that the power to heal was with the person himself and not the means, not the means employed. In fact, this is the case that the method used. But in this case, putting mud uh, on somebody's eyes would naturally have the opposite effect. It would make a person who could see blind. It has been pointed out that God had worked in a similar way as this in the Old Testament. 
For example, he bought the water in the desert not from the soft earth, but from a flinty rock. He had the sting of the serpent of fire by the serpent of brass, and he overthrew the walls of Jericho by Ramsmond. When we come to verse 7, the miracle did not take place until the man responded, which, which appears he did immediately. Jesus told him to go out and wash in the pool of Siloam. And this was, a, this was a, a well known location, first mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Mary, Nehemiah. It's quite close to the temple, and pro probably even this blind man will be able to find his way there unaided. The name, the name Siloam was particularly significant. It means sent, and its significance lies in the fact that Jesus frequently referred to himself as the one who was sent by his father. In fact, in the previous chapter of this gospel, chapter 8, um, this happened four times. So could we now say that symbolically, the one who was himself sent by, by his father now sends this man to himself? Then we are told that the man of Bay that the man of Bay was immediately healed. He went and washed and came home singing. There are often some parallels here with the account in the Old Testament of the healing of man from leprosy through the word of Elisha. Naaman was told to wash in the river Jordan seven times to be cured of his leprosy. The main major difference here is that where this man immediately Naaman needs some persuasion from his servants to comply. When we come to verse 8 and 9, we discover that there is now an identification problem. So great is the change in this man's appearance that neighbours and others who had seen him begging can't agree as to whether they are looking at the same man. He himself has testified that he was the same person. And this just shows us how great the miracle was. He has brought about such a change in his appearance. And it's a, 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 it is only at this point as well that uh, we learn that he had actually been a beggar. And as the place where Jesus found him was close to the temple, it would have been at one of the temple doors that he did his begging. That is where a lot of people would come through. And he could expect to receive the most charity. It is evident that Jesus deliberately shows a, a very familiar figure upon whom to perform this miracle. The people then ask him, this is verse 10, how his eyes were opened. And it appears from what follows that this question was not put to him with the best intentions. He replies to their question, verse 11, setting out very simply exactly what had happened, Refer, but referring to the one who had healed him as the man called Jesus. He probably, was probably given that information from some of the bystanders who witnessed Jesus putting the mud on his eyes. By now, Jesus of Nazareth had become a well-known figure around Jerusalem. In the next verse 12, they ask him where the man is, but he doesn't know. Now that's as far as we took the reading earlier because our focus is on the fact of the miracle itself as a proof, a proof of uh, Christ's deity. But the, re the remaining verses do have that strategic as well. From verse 13 it appears that these people who were asking the question were, were looking for trouble. Because the reason that they wanted to find Jesus was to bring him to, before the leaders. But as they can't find him, they take the man instead. It appears before the Pharisees, most of whom we know were totally opposed to Jesus, who in turn frequently warned his followers against them. Uh, one such warning occupies almost the whole of Matthew 23. But in the case of this miracle, these Pharisees did everything they could to try and avoid admitting that a genuine miracle had actually taken place. They interviewed the man, then they interviewed his parents, then they called the man back again, asking him the same questions as before, trying to find a loophole that would give them grounds uh, for denying that there really had been a miracle. 
uh, they failed in this miserably, uh, being confounded particularly uh, by the healed man's own simple testimony based on his uh, experience. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And in the end we find them clutching at straws. Jesus must be a sinner because he'd broken the Sabbath law, they claimed. But in fact, uh, Jesus had always been very careful to honour the Sabbath. What he had done was, what he had not done was to follow the traditions that they had added to the fourth commandment. There was nothing in the Sabbath regulations which prohibited works of mercy being carried out on that day. Yet this is the second time we find Jewish leaders accusing Jesus of breaking the law by healing somebody on the Sabbath. Uh, the previous occasion is one we've already looked at, uh, the healing of the man by the pool of Beth Bethesda. It's instructed to, uh, instructed to compare this, uh, uh, their reaction in this instance with a reaction in a very similar uh, situation in the, uh, to the first miracle carried out by the apostles in the book of Acts. The apostles are specifically commissioned by Christ himself were also given authority by him to perform miracles and for the same reason to authenticate and their message. And you are probably familiar with the account in, in Acts 3 where Peter, in Christ's name, healed the man, man at the temple gate who was crippled from birth. Peter and John were subsequently called before the Sanhedrin to, to give an account of what happened. And the members of the Sanhedrin, it says, took note of the fact that Peter and John had been with Jesus. And Peter made it quite clear that the miracle had been done in Jesus' name. And when the Sanhedrin, members of the Sanhedrin uh, conferred together as to what to do, and this is what they said, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem, they have done an outstanding miracle, but we cannot deny it. No those of us cannot deny it. They did their utmost to deny that the miracle in here in John's Gospel. And so it probably um, be many of them were the, the same men that were involved on both occasions. It makes me wonder whether their failed attempt at on this, with this early miracle in John's Gospel warned them against attempting to do so on that second occasion. I want them to return now to the question of the purpose of miracles. As I've already said, the main reason is to authenticate the miracle work of somebody sent from God. Thus preacher, uh, Peter, preaching to the crowds on the day of Pente Pentecost, could say, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. Now, healing miracles all Obviously, have uh, 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 great miracles and blessings on those that were healed. And by doing this, they demonstrated the compassionate nature of God. But that was not all. They also served as illustrations. The healing of the body is a picture of the healing of the soul. We look just at a couple of examples of this. In, in this miracle. In the physical realm, this man was born totally blind from birth. In a similar way, in the spiritual realm, every one of us is born spiritually blind. And this has been so uh, ever since sin entered the human race through the first man. We are now all sinners, both by nature and practice. And, and uh, sin together with Satan combine to blind our hearts and minds. Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. This uh, blindness is the result of sin and closely associated with it and, and with hardness of heart. And the first thing we need to do is to recognise it. 
This is what the Pharisees refused to do, they were self-sufficient. They claimed that they were not blind, hence the Lord's verdict on them uh, in the last verse of this chapter, 41, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now you claim you can see your guilt remains. Another spiritual parallel here, parallel here was for the, the man, for the man to be healed, but there was a need for washing. There was only one place where that could happen, at the pool of Siloam. And when that happened, the healing would be complete, and the man would have sight for the first time, and would continue to have it through the remainder of his earthly life. And how our sin has to be dealt with in the same way. It has to be washed away. And there is only one place where that can happen, and it's called Calvary. The cleansing or purifying agent there is the blood of Christ. Hence Revelation 1 verse 5, to him who loves us and has freed us, the authorised version says, washed us. Washed us from our sin by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It reminds, reminds me of the old gospel being made in scores with his pertinent challenge, are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's for the sacrifice of his life, the shedding of his blood on, on Calvary's cross, still brings forgiveness and cleansing for the sin to all those who simply apply to him in repentance and faith. Uh, having spoken about physical and, spi uh, spiritual and uh, physical and spiritual healing, it's worth pointing out that in all this, the man in question, I keep having to refer to him as the man, we never told his name, the man received both. That he was also healed spiritually, there can be no doubt. Through his interrogation by the Pharisees and his subsequent meeting with Jesus, we see him coming from a, a position where he can speak of the, the man they call Jesus, then to recognise him as a prophet, and finally acknowledging as Lord uh, and worshipping him. I, I, I just conclude now with the words of a, another commentator, which I have quoted before, but which sums this. Uh, all up so beautifully in just a few words. Such mighty work, works could never have been done by one that was merely man. In the cure of this blind man, we see nothing less than the finger of God. Why should we despair of salvation while we have such a saviour? Where is the spiritual disease that he cannot take away? He can open the eyes of the most sinful and ignorant and make him see things that they never saw before. He can send light into the darkest heart and cause blindness and prejudice to pass away. This is our Saviour. Let's now come to our final hymn, which is Teach Me Thy Way.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen. Amen.